Hey, I'm Sohail. I've just completed a PhD on the mental health of Iranians and Afghans during the asylum process. I'm also a migrants' rights organiser, and I've co-founded several charities and groups in the area, including the Migrant Connections Festival, the Cotton Tree Trust, and Walk and Talk Migrant Welcome Tours. Following on from the excellent Our Six Society podcast, hosted by Charlotte, I'm going to run through some of my PhD thesis findings and recommendations. The first question in the podcast outlines the legal terms refugee and asylum seeker. These can be really useful in understanding people's rights and entitlements, but my PhD recommends using migration labels that better reflect people's lived experiences. Legal terms such as asylum seeker and refugee can replicate rights denying and divisive Home Office language. The many Iranians and Afghans I spoke to during my work did not wish to be defined using these labels. I recommend that charities and academics move beyond these legal definitions and group people according to, firstly, how difficult it is for them to obtain permanent status and security, and secondly, how supportive post-migration conditions are for integration and inclusion. This is called the Sanctuary Seeker Framework. Although this framework can provide an initial basis for charities and academics, charities should use it to help their populations self-define. In the podcast, Hannah helpfully explains some of the factors affecting the mental health of sanctuary seekers. In particular, Hannah mentions the precarious and unsafe conditions until asylum is granted. My PhD covered this in depth. Many of the participants had few stable physical spaces in which to feel safe and recover from difficult migration experiences. Unhygienic and isolated accommodation perpetuated feelings of instability, insecurity and rootlessness among sanctuary seekers. Accommodation conditions alongside policies of forced dispersal undermine access to legal advice and mental health support and other forms of services. When describing the spaces in which they recuperated from asylum process stresses and other migration stresses, only a few people referred to charities. This could be because charities struggle to maintain a stable space, with organisations often being forced to move accommodation due to financial issues. It may also be linked to charities being orientated towards practical services related to asylum claims, welfare and language training, rather than being able to provide an informal social space. Sanctuary seekers should be accommodated in, t- in urban centres linked to the diaspora, voluntary sector and sanctuary seeking community networks. They should be close to me- amenities and in clean housing. Migrants, migrant organisations should create and support online spaces of safety. Charities c- could support and grow such groups by providing people data, smartphones and basic tutorials to overcome potential digital exclusion as well as for moderation. Hannah also very helpfully mentioned issues around discrimination and marginalisation. I'm an Iranian and we form the largest refugee nationality in the UK in the last 10 years and even more. There have been several attacks and hate crimes on Iranian sanctuary seekers. Um, And a few months before I began the thesis, uh, very sadly, a 17-year-old Kurdish-Iranian teenager, Rekhar Ahmed, was beaten by 30 people and left almost fatally injured. The attack occurred occurred in Croydon, the primary site of asylum applications in the UK. Before he was beaten, Rekhar's assailants shouted, You are asylum seekers, you are refugees, you have to go back to your country. In my PhD, Sanctuary Seeker Experiences, during the asylum process were characterised by neglect, social exclusion, alongside discrimination. This negatively affected mental health. Participants reported feeling invisible and that their suffering was rarely acknowledged. People felt that they were framed as parasites by the media and wider society. In the process, they were dehumanised. Life in London was a battle against Home Office restrictions. and There was a wariness in existence. Sanctuary seekers should be given opportunities by migration charities and local authorities to counter negative public perceptions. Self-organised 
and charity supported networks such as Survivor Speak Out and Breed Voices may be useful, as might the burgeoning sanctuary seeker theatre scene, such as board, the Borderline Theatre Ensemble and Psych Light and Phosphorus Theatre. Sanctuary seekers should be supported by migrant charities in reshaping the everyday environment they live in to reflect their histories and their identities. For example, after Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, NHS Trust began conducting background checks on patients they thought might not be eligible for free care, school children in Lewisham hand delivered Christmas cards to their local hospital asking them to stop charging their migrant mothers. Children inserted their narratives and histories into a space that was discriminating against their mothers and in the process called for structural change. The podcast also speaks about being in limbo during the asylum process and facing an almost indefinite uncertainty. My PhD describes how after the substantive asylum interview, sanctuary seekers felt trapped in an unending cycle of overwhelming bureaucracy that gradually ground down people's will to continue. While waiting, people watched their plans for the future unravel. Waiting was associated with a loss of dignity and a fearful uncertainty. The bureaucracy of the Home Office and the asylum process figuratively kept people between life and death, while the asylum support, which was very limited, accomplished this more literally. The Home Office should re reduce asylum process waiting times by giving people status if they have waited for a long time without a response. They should also provide regular updates of asylum application progress. Where cases appear conclusive, the Home Office could grant asylum to some Iranians and Afghans based on initial screening interviews and documentation. The podcast critically mentions a, suspicious, a suspicion politics that governs asylum policy in Europe. This was very prominent in my research. Participants reported feeling attacked, threatened, disbelieved and re-traumatised by, by the asylum interview. They were betrayed by the institution and process they had anticipated would support and protect them. The asylum process forces sanctuary seekers to speak and act in a certain way. And this is related to this suspicion politics. So firstly, there is an expected behaviour of people that they must speak an unfiltered truth to Home Office officials. Secondly, there are limited and specific spaces in which sanctuary seekers can speak about their experiences, namely the asylum interview. Finally, the Home Office only accepts certain types of asylum stories. Stories have to have exact dates and timelines and often describe a helpless and hapless victim. So this is the perception and experiences of the people I spoke to. Home Office representatives should be burdened with proving applicants wrong, rather than applicants being burdened with proving that their cases are credible, as is currently the case. In fact, the latest Home Office consultation on changes to the Immigration Bill wants to make this burden of proof even tougher for people seeking asylum. Asylum interviews should constitute a series of conversations over a few weeks, each lasting no more than an hour or two, rather than a single, long, grueling interrogation. During the interview, interviewers should have a believing, not sceptical attitude. Asylum applicants should have an opportunity to speak, and to get to know the interviewer and interpreter beforehand, and be given examples of likely questions, specifically around difficult experiences. Mental health therapy and peer support groups should be made accessible to sanctuary seekers before, during and after interviews. In the podcast, Zara and Abigail offer a great overview of the kinds of support available to people in the UK, to sanctuary seekers in specific. In my PhD, I asked practitioners, community members and people who had sought asylum about mental health and wellbeing services. Two key findings emerged from this. Firstly, the cultural humility can improve access to um, mainstream mental health services. Western mental health concepts often dominated the interaction between mental health practitioners and Iranian and Afghan sanctuary seekers. Practitioners could usefully be open to, understand and acknowledge non-Western mental health concepts. For example, spiritual well-being could be a mental health outcome of therapy with religious Afghan patients. Positive psychology constructs around employment referring to existential fulfillment, vigour, dedication, 
absorption and, uh, and other concepts like that could be particularly useful with Iranian and Afghan sanctuary seekers as they chime with the cultural values identified in my PhD around reciprocity, responsibility and hard work. Formal mental health services were rarely accessed by participants, particularly Afghans. This was partly linked to a lack of English language ability. However, it was also linked to a limited practitioner and GP understanding of different cultural conceptions of mental health. GP surgeries should allow additional time to see sanctuary seekers, recognising the time needed to understand their cultural conceptions of and language used to talk about mental health, as well as the additional time required for interpretation. This is already the case in some GP surgeries. This recommendation could provide a post-registration focus to the excellent Safe Surgeries campaign um, led by the Doctors of the World charity. This initiative encourages GP practices to improve sanctuary seeker accessibility by suggesting seven steps, including, for instance, uh, never insisting on proof of address documents, identification or proof of immigration status. I'm currently working with prominent Afghan organisations and charities to co-create a guide for mental health practitioners working with Afghan sanctuary seekers. This guide could include important cultural considerations around emotional expression, shame, collectivism, spirituality and religion, and other really crucial things which will improve the quality of mental health services and also access to. Uh, other things the guide might, might include are a list of culturally relevant mental health terms, suggested questions and prompts for the mental, uh, mental status examination, and also questions and prompts for GPs, studies, uh, case studies and vignettes to help practitioner understanding, and also help them understand the experience of the asylum process uh, from the perspective of Afghan sanctuary seekers. So I'm really, really grateful for the Centre um, or Society in Mental Health for inviting me to talk about their findings, um, about my findings uh, today. And uh, I really hope you enjoy the podcast. And if you'd like any more information about the work I do, or if you'd like me to present my findings in detail, or if you're interested in collaborating, then please get in touch with me on email or Twitter. Look up my KCL profile page. Um, I'd really love to connect. Thank you so much.